Welcome. Welcome to Mystery at the Library. I'm Rebecca Vanuk, the Executive Director of Library Reads. And for those of you who have joined us before, I know you all know about Library Reads, but for those of you who do not know, I won't take up too much time talking about it. You can please visit www.libraryreads.org and you can find out all about us and what we do. And you can also find the fact that Joseph's book was on our list. Yay! He made, he made our January library reads list. So um, library reads official, hurrah. So, but enough about library reads. You can look at the website, find it all out. You can shoot me an email if you've got any questions about the organization. But this is Mystery at the Library, the 17th installment actually, which is very exciting. And Mystery at the Library is brought to you by Sourcebooks and Baker and Taylor tonight. So we're here on Zoom. We are also streaming the event on Facebook Live. So welcome to those of you who are watching us on Facebook. I am thrilled to be here this evening with international best-selling author Joseph Knox to talk about his twisty thriller and Library Reads winner, <laughs> True Crime Story. <laughs> now, before we begin, I have just a few housekeeping items to share. If you've got questions for Joseph tonight, um, please utilize the Google form. The link will show up shortly in the chat in just a moment. Um, we will have the author questions go through there just so that we don't lose it in the chat. Now we want you guys to be using that chat box, say hi to each other, say hi to us, tell us where you're from. We always love to see that. But if you put your specific questions into the Google form, then they won't get lost in kind of the running chat there. And if you are familiar, we spend the second half of the program doing audience questions. So start, start asking us the good stuff. Don't forget. Now, if you are watching us on Facebook, just go ahead and use the comment section on Facebook. We've got our friends at Sourcebooks moderating over on there, and they will take your questions and feed them to us in the Q&A box or in the Google box. So it'll all be fine. So we'll still get you. Now, don't forget, if you ask a question or if you participate in the trivia poll that we have halfway through, you will be entered to win a mystery book bundle from our friends at Sourcebooks. So winners will be chosen at the end of the event. So that's all the usual stuff. Now let's get into it with our new friend, Joseph. Hi, Joseph. It is Hello. midnight where he is also. So let's be nice to him. Um, and he's also got, what is it, an eight month old? So he's he's running on no sleep. So I will um, I'll do my best to to keep it to keep it smooth and easy tonight. <laughs> but he's also he looks pretty wide awake. So I think we're good. So do a little introduction. <laughs> Joseph Knox, born and raised around Manchester, England, where he worked in bars and bookshops before moving to London. His debut novel, Sirens, the first in the Aidan Watts Waits trilogy, was a bestseller and has been translated into 18 languages. True Crime Story is his first standalone novel and was a number one Sunday Times bestseller. I'm so glad you could join us tonight, Joseph. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy life and evening to, to be with us today. <laughs> It's such a pleasure. I, I'm I'm thrilled to be here, and thank you to everyone who is tuning in. And um, yes, please do send your questions as well. Send us those questions. So I have some questions to start off already. So true crime story. Okay. Now, for those of you, hopefully, I think everybody has probably written read the book. Some sometimes we get folks who are partway through, or their group is reading it, so we won't give away too many spoilers. But I know when I was reading it at the very beginning, I was like, okay, is this actually a true crime? Is it what's going on? And I'm like, okay, no, it's fiction. I know I'm, I'm a librarian. I know how to figure these things out. <laughs> but what I really, really enjoyed about it was the format that you chose to tell the story in. It's very unique. We've got, you know, you, you twist in interview transcripts emails, documents from the police and others. We're talking to friends, family, acquaintances, students, all kinds of like just, it's not just a, oh, chapter by chapter. Like we're getting little pieces of each. And the more I read, 
the more I felt like, okay, I know these people now. Like I'm getting real interesting insights into all of these people just paragraph by paragraph. So why did you decide to format it that way instead of just just straight up literary chapter by chapter story? Um, well, I suppose it was for a few different reasons really. Um, first of all, I first encountered a book that was written in this style when I was reading about the American singer-songwriter Warren Zevon, who wrote the song Werewolves of London. Oh. And that's right. <laughs> and it's just one of my all-time heroes. You know, I, I grew up listening to his music and I just, even from a very young age, could recognise that he was a brilliant writer um, and, a, and a lyricist. And his songs were kind of quite dark, but also quite funny, and they appealed to me in a big way. Um, but I was reading a biography that had been pulled together by his um, ex-wife uh, after, after his death. And it was written in this style, what they call an oral history oral style. Oral history, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the, the basic conceit of that is that you will have perhaps one paragraph from shared from the memories of one person and the very next one will be shared from the memories of someone else but they will all be talking about one wider thing so for example in that book uh, a chapter might refer to the recording of a certain album and you would have um, I don't know someone like Jackson Brown recalling his memories of it and then maybe Bruce Springsteen saying oh here's what I remember about that and it, it gives everything a kind of documentary feel I suppose and as I was reading this book I just thought um, this would be such an incredible way to write a novel this would be so interesting so fun you would have access to all these different voices um, and you could really create a really broad picture of a certain topic and I had the idea and immediately discounted it because I just knew that I was not a good enough writer to pull it off. I knew that each of those voices would need its own peculiarities, its own sense of humour. They would need their own passions and interests, um, backgrounds and all of these things. And that is before we even think about what the wider story itself is. And so I essentially filed the, the idea into the back of my mind while I went away and wrote three much more conventional noir novels, uh, which were kind of first person detective uh, uh, books, which be became my full time job as I was writing them. One of the frustrations, though, with with writing those books was that I was stuck in the head of this one character. And this one character was a guy like me. He was a young white guy living in, at the time, the centre of Manchester in, in England. And it just felt like a very long time to spend with one character and trapped in one head. And it, it got to the point where it was almost like his thoughts were my thoughts and um, I, I couldn't really tell us apart in some senses. I, I don't know if you ever have like a similar thing in America but in, in England often I will see someone walking their dog and think wow that that dog looks a lot like the person and <laughs> you, you kind of ask yourself the question did, did the person start to look more like the dog or is the dog looking more like the person or, yes. or did they just find each other I don't know <laughs> and um, so with Aiden it was like that you know I, I felt like we were turning into each other and I couldn't tell which one of us was the dog and which one of us was the owner so that oh, seems like a, exactly um who's who's picking up the the doo-doo um, right. yeah uh, it felt like it was me all the time so I I was really looking for a new challenge I suppose anyway and each of my books reacts against the previous one. My first one is, is a very cold book. And so the next book was set in a heat wave, um, things like that. You know, I, I like to rebound and do almost the opposite. Um, and so the opposite of just being trapped in this one voice was to do all of these different voices. And in the interim, um, uh, just a final thought on the format, there had been this explosion of podcasts and true crime podcasts as well. Mm -hmm. And so 
I essentially had this idea 10 years before and then I wrote these books that gave me the skills to maybe write it and then the finishing touch was this explosion of of true crime and and those podcasts for example things like Serial which was the the first true crime podcast I I listened to as as is probably the case with a lot of people um it seemed to be delivered very similarly to the oral history. You would have one character say, well, this is how I remember it. And then another come in and say, well, actually it was more like this. And you have to sift through those things and find what you believe is the true through line. And that was when it all came together for me. It was apparent immediately that a true crime would be the perfect thing to hang all of this on. So that that actually is going to lead me into another question that I've got is that, as you mentioned, true crime is just really hot right now. It's <laughs> because of podcasts. You know, there's that whole TV show, The Only Murders in the Building. True crime is having, I mean, it's always been popular. We as librarians know, that's a very popular section in our nonfiction collections has been for decades, but it really, I think because of podcasts, it's really having a moment right now, mm. right? So you mentioned Serial, for example, were there any other kind of um, true crimes or anything like that that sort of inspired the story here? Or is this completely all from your imagination? Um, I, 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 think, I think certainly in the presentation of the story, I, I, I've probably listened to most of the big true crime podcasts out there. Mm -hmm. I became, I, I, I don't know, as a, as a crime writer, it is something that you're naturally fascinated with anyway. So it was never something that I did for research. That It was just very easy to stack up hours and hours and hours of listening time because I think of the, the, the twin uh, appeals of the, the true crime thing. Of course, you've got the, the case, which has its own traumas and sadnesses. Perhaps there's a missing person or a murdered one. But then the voices as well are what really appealed to me. I think of something like S-Town, which was like a spiritual sequel to Serial um, and an excellent podcast. And it, I, I cannot remember the, the name of the town actually in America where it was recorded, but um, the the quality of the voices were just so wonderful and the characters that emerged from this real life sad story were just people I loved spending time with and so so I think I think in 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 the presentation of it that there is a huge influence from true crime maybe not necessarily any kind of specific case mm -hmm. but um as I began writing it I realized that one of the um, sort of tensions throughout the book was this idea of fact versus fiction yeah. and um, I think when I when I, I go back and look at it that that really came from one of the original true crime uh, books which was In Cold Blood by Truman Capote and that is has always been one of my favorite books. I, I read it when I was a very young man, had a huge effect on me. I, I've always thought that Capote was a, a wonderful writer anyway, you know, just in his, his, his fiction and short stories. But that book has, has a real gravity and a real power and it's almost inescapable in a certain sense. But when you look into the facts of it, um, much of it is disputed. And a lot of the people who were interviewed at the time and who were presented in the book came out afterwards and said, well, it didn't actually happen like that, or I never said that, or I was never there, you know? Um, and in a sense, I think Capote um, was almost too much of a novelist uh, to not perfect things, um, if you see what I mean. He, he was not a journalist. He was never going to do that. His uh, fascination was with story and with character and with art, I suppose, rather than reality in a sense. And so even in that original book, which created this, this whole genre in a sense, there, there has always been that tension of what is real and what is fake. And it seems to be something that is just embedded into true crime. And so it, it, it found its way into this book as well, I suppose. Um, so, so I think all of those, all of the facts of 
true crime itself kind of bled into the book. That reminds me of the saying that, you know, what is it? There's, it's not that there's two sides to every story, there's three sides to every story, your side, their side, and the truth. <laughs> so exactly. Definitely. exactly. And I really, I, I loved in the book the way you you have these interviews and like someone is saying something and then the next one is someone saying, oh yeah, that might be right. <laughs> <laughs> or, oh, that's not how I remember it. But if that's what they say, I bet that's probably true. And it, it really yeah. made me feel like these were real people giving real interviews because right, everybody's memory is flawed. There's the, the whole thing, you know, police kind of say that all the time that they could ask 10 people what color somebody was wearing that came in and robbed the bank and you'd get 10 different colors because memory is faulty. And, and so I really felt that way hearing the voices of these characters that they were like, well, this is what I remember. Hmm. And then as soon as someone else disputed it, they're like, oh, I don't remember saying that, but maybe I, <laughs> and, and yes. it yeah, yeah. realistic. Yes. And, I, and I so, mean, the yeah. The, 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 the fallibility of memory is almost a, a, a another thing and, and, and yes. the reader has to work out what is someone genuinely misremembering something and what is someone misremembering something to make themselves look better as we all do right or misremembering something for darker purposes um right. So it's a, it's a messy, confusing book. Now, now I think of it. <laughs> in a good way, though. In a good way. You know, I, I think I, I've said before in this program that one of the things that I love in my mystery books is I, I'm a big sucker for the unreliable narrator trope. And here, what I felt was so interesting about that was they were all kind of unreliable narrators, but I didn't yes. feel that any of them were on purpose trying to yes. deceive I mean until we got kind of closer to the conclusion but I definitely was like oh yeah these are just everyday people and they're all young when this happens you know some yes. of them the conversations are happening a few years later but they're all you know in their early 20s late teens and yeah. you know how are you supposed to this is how I remembered it the end like I didn't feel anyone was purposely deceptive and yet I was like oh it's a whole book full of unreliable <laughs> narrators that's awesome so as, as you as you said earlier this you know there's a lot of blending here in and in a lot of true crime of fact versus fiction so on the fact side we've even pulled you into this story. You appear <laughs> in this book, you are a character in this book, you are a driving, you know, the overarching person in this book. So talk to me about that. What was what was your decision to put yourself into this book? Um, and did you worry about that at all? That maybe people would think you were a little more nefarious than you really are? Or, um, or how, did, how did that work? And how did it feel writing yourself as a character? I'd love to, love to get your take uh -huh. on that. Um... It, it was a it was a strange thing really because it was not an original it was not originally part of the book okay so the the book was written completely without me in it um and focusing more on Evelyn essentially but it it became clear at a certain point that um Evelyn might not um be able to tell the story herself and so the book would have to be handed to a an editor or a friend or someone who is the custodian of these words now every step I I was really desperate really to to make it as convincingly like a true crime as to look as convincingly like a, a true crime book as possible and um you know to the extent that I think in the copyright pages um the photographs are i don't know if it is in the american one but certainly in the uk edition maybe it's not here but anyway in in, in the uk edition the photographs are all attributed to characters in the book um, oh. and so for some people who have gotten through it and thought well okay that that wasn't real and then they've gone back looking for clues i've trip them over once again um yes. so, so I was I was doing all these silly things basically to um to to make it appear as convincing as possible and so one of the things that troubled me was that my name was going to be on the cover of it <laughs> and so I thought well okay what if I was the editor 
um, that, that she handed it to. What if I was the friend? It's in Manchester. I lived in Manchester. I could have met her at uh, the launch of my first book. But then, of course, you know, the way my imagination works, as, as you've had some insight into from <laughs> reading, reading the book, was that um, if, if I'm going to be in a, a, a character in the book, I can't be a clean, nice, lovely guy. I need to be a bit of a dirtbag. And from there, it just seemed like the most natural thing to feed into the other themes of the book, which are these themes of manipulation and lying and men exerting power over women. And um, that that just seemed like a, a, a the, the only thing that the Knox character could or should represent. He should not be there as any kind of savior. And after all, he is taking this book and selling it as his own. Mm -hmm. That seems quite dubious. Uh, to me on the page anyway and so I just thought okay let's push him into overdrive and have him be like a kind of a user and uh, maybe he's like cheating on his partner and maybe he is um, lying to Evelyn and maybe he's manipulating her and maybe he's angling to take credit for her work as well um, and those just seemed like a lot of pertinent things that were going on and so that is an interesting thing about the fact versus fiction element, I suppose, is that the Knox character, in my opinion, is, I, I hope, the, the character I resemble the least, in a sense. You know, he is a confection, where there are characters in the book who I, um, who I feel much more in tune with, and for example, Evelyn, you know, she is this struggling young writer who feels like she hasn't quite cracked it and hasn't quite made it, which was all the kind of feelings that I, I had at the time that I was writing the book. I'd, I'd recently had a book rejected and I just did not feel at my most confident and felt like I was being passed by by other people and things like that. You know, all these crazy neuroses you have when, when you're a writer. Um, and so I, I feel I feel a lot of sympathy and kinship with Evelyn. I also feel a lot of, of kinship with Kimberly as well. Um, and so, it, it, like to me, it's it's um, it's really interesting when when people ask about uh, the the Knox character and what it's like to to write myself because I, I feel like there's much more of me in some of the other characters and and even in Andrew. God help me. Um, who is you know, a, a, a bit of a git, as we would say here, um, but we probably, our sense of humour isn't a million miles away from each other. Um, and yeah, so, so I, I feel like I'm dispersed quite evenly almost over, over all the characters in there. Um, and and as, as, a, as a final note on that, the, there have been quite a lot of... Um, messages taking me to task for my actions in the book um, and a few people quite angry with me um, a couple of people who aren't going to read my books anymore really um, yes yeah and, and I'm sure I, I'm sure that they will <laughs> realize at some point but to each of those messages that I've received I respond in character and <laughs> say well you weren't there you don't know I did my best in that situation. This isn't, you know, it's not the way that Penguin or source books have made it look. And, oh, fascinating. Um, and I just think that's an added fun thing. And uh, hopefully, yeah. you know, a year from now, they will somehow encounter the truth. And, you know, I hope they, they will have a laugh and like me more uh, <laughs> rather than, you know, hunting me down and, and, subjecting me to some kind of Stephen King misery type scenario um but either way you know headlines a headline so right I mean yeah. that, right that's true that's true and you know the, the people who have to announce that they're flouncing off are always the ones that are coming back anyway <laughs> that's right they're, they're not staying away so I that really I did find that fascinating that as soon as I sort of got the gist that I'm like okay it's him he's a character and then when you when you kind of turned out to, as you said, a dirt bag, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's fascinating that he didn't take this opportunity to like 
paint himself as a benevolent, <laughs> helpful editor that has nothing to do with anyone in the crime. No, not at all. Like that. <laughs> that was a I really should have should have just like gotten some mentions of like my six pack and my right. my hard pecs in there right. and things like that. Yeah. Joseph um, Knox swept back his flowing hair and yeah, yeah, <laughs> which isn't falling out or receding. It's it's thick and luscious. I yeah. love it. I love it. Yeah. So there are, of course, lots of details in this story and 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 lots of people. I would love, and I'm sure that our audience would love to know what was your strategy for keeping all that organized. I mean, I really feel like one of the things I was really impressed with the characters is they are all very individual. Like I, I always knew who was talking, what they were talking about. I got a very good sense of the type of person that they were. Um, and so as a reader, that all seems like, oh, that must be so easy. But you've got like, what, 17 characters. I didn't count, but you know, something. you've got like this enormous amount of characters who are all very individual and they all have an interesting role to play here. So how did you keep that all straight? Do you, do you keep notes? Do you, did you change things around? Do, are you one of those authors where like the characters speak in your head and have to come out? Like, tell us a little bit about that. I'm always interested in, in how characters come about. Um, well, thank you very much for that. Um, it was, it was, it was strange. Uh, I, as I, as I said earlier, I wrote this book after um, another book, which I'd written uh, immediately before it was was declined by my publisher in the UK, and at the time I had, you know, as as as, as, as always, when when you write something, you have to really commit to it, and you have to tell yourself and believe yourself that this is the one and that this is the real deal, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. And in this case, it really wasn't. They were right to turn it down. It just wasn't a good enough book. And with hindsight, I see that and accept it and believe it was the best case scenario that things turned out as they did. But at the time, I had not published a book for uh, in, in the previous year. I'd taken that year off because I was burned out from writing the trilogy that I wrote. Um, which I'd written in three subsequent years. And I wrote this other book, it was turned down. And so suddenly when it came time to try and write True Crime Story, which was this crazy idea I'd had in my back pocket all these years, there was not much time. And really from the very first day, from literally the title landing in my head and realizing, okay, that oral history idea will be attached to a podcast type true crime scenario. It was really about four months uh, that it came together, which is the fastest I've ever written anything. And that, you know, really speaks to how terrified I was. Um, and I did not really, for example, there is this whiteboard in the background here with colored post-it notes and some, some words on there. That's brand new because I've moved house, I should explain uh, to the audience. And um, I, I really um, haven't used it before. I'm not, not a big filer. Um, I make a lot of notes. I make a lot of notes, but they are usually uh, in my phone. I, I recently copied and pasted my notes that I've been making for a new book into a Word document uh, to start trying to put them in some kind of order because it's all just mad stuff that I've written down at three in the morning, usually drunk uh, or, or something like that, and makes Sometimes no sense. those are the best ideas. Sometimes, if you can find them. Um, <laughs> And there were 25,000 words in this phone note, you know, so like a quarter of a novel, just a crazy amount. And so that is how I make notes. And, and then once I really start the book, I don't really look at them again. Okay. It's, it's just me um, working out what I'm thinking and what I'm thinking about. And I do, I flick through them. And when I get stuck, I'll, I'll open the document and I will scan through it, maybe looking for a line or a word that is going to, spark with whatever I'm writing in the moment but I'm not someone who makes a big plan I just don't have that kind of brain I don't I don't 
um, have a logical brain at all. I really feel my way through the book. Mm -hmm. And so with True Crime Story, it, every, everything just came about very organically. I had had this idea of someone being kidnapped and then thrown back out of a van for reasons that they don't understand and that they don't understand for years. I'd had that idea for a long time. Um, and so I knew that would be the opening of the book. And then I knew it would be in Manchester. I knew it would need to be characters who've been very recently thrown together. So that suggested a university to me um, and young people. And so then it really did just come about um, because I was just naturally trying to populate around this, this missing young woman, Zoe. Um, and I think maybe the intensity of the writing process helped me hold it all together in my brain. And I really do do a lot of rewriting. I should say that, you know, oh, it was not, okay. mm -hmm. it was never just start to finish. I, I, I will write a paragraph and then I will rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it until I believe it. And then I will go on to the next one. Um, and also once the book was finished, there were a few different drafts as we kind of tightened it and then added the Knox character and things like that. So I, I'm a big believer in editing and rewriting. For me, that is where it comes to life. Um, but I think really the speed with which the book was written helped me hold it all together in my brain because it, it was almost like I was living it, I suppose, because I, because I was I was on the book for sort of 16 to 18 hours a day a lot a lot of the time just looking completely insane with my hair up in the air and a beard and stink lines coming off me and all of that um so that, that, that's essentially how how it was written um and now it's a blur and I'm just grateful that that, that it happened um, I'm glad that it's done and out there in the world yeah and, and it's very hard to believe with with all of them it's hard to believe Mm -hmm. um really um because when you write a book you are just clinging on for dear life uh a lot of the time um and yes you know and, and then so, you know you you think you're not going to finish it it's going to fail you're going to just die before you get to the end because you're so tired and in my case drunk and <laughs> you um it, it, it is very strange when you get to the end and, and then you're always depressed as well because you've had such an intense relationship with it it's, it's very hard to let it go and um so then I'm I'm really sad and I walk around on my own for hours for kind of weeks on end uh like being quite soppy and tearful and then I just kind of forget that I wrote it <laughs> really that is Really fascinating insight. I know, you know, all of us here are readers and I think we sort of feel that way when we're reading a book and then it's done and we're like, oh no, but these are my friends. I just, you know, I spent all this time with this. I don't think we ever, at least I never stopped to think about how that must feel for the author who has spent literally months on reading something, not days or weeks reading it. I mean, months writing it and yeah, when it's gone, it's out there in the world and you don't have it anymore. I never thought about that. So thank you for sharing <laughs> that insight with us. I, th I find that fascinating. So, whoop, all right. Well, we have, I can see tons of questions coming in here for us. So let's go into our trivia portion. That kind of gives us a nice little break between this and into the, into the, into the audience questions. So we'll transition to the trivia. So since True Crime Story, of course, is an exploration of obsession with true crime. So we're gonna test our audience's knowledge on true crime pop culture. So in just a moment, the friends at Sourcebooks are gonna pop some poll questions up on your screen. And audience, your task is to pick out which one of the true crime media does not exist. Now, if you're watching on Facebook Live, um, the questions are going to be entered into the comments section. So use that to enter. And remember that this is how you can get entered to win a mystery prize pack. So question one, which one of these true crime books doesn't exist? And if any of you choose In Cold Blood, you're in big trouble because he already talked about it even. <laughs> um, so we got... <laughs> So here, here are some titles for you. Which one is the fake? 
And now Joseph, while the audience is, is answering these questions, I would like you to maybe spend a couple minutes telling us the kinds of books that you like to read. Um, do you like to read true crime in your spare time? Do you like to read crime fiction? Do you like historical romance? I mean, we, we wanna know. And if you've got any suggestions that you'd like to recommend to people. Yeah, absolutely. Um... First of all, I read all over the map, and so often I find that when I'm in a reading rut, changing genre can be very useful, um, or, or changing the kind of thing I'm reading. So generally, my, my mode is kind of dark fiction or crime fiction. You can see my cat's tail in the background there, um, if anyone's disturbed by that. Um, <laughs> The, it just whisked over there. He's, we he's all like it when cats appear on the screen. It's <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, he's called George Smiley, um, and he, and he's a very love, lovely boy. Um, but he's he's been a bit shy at the moment. Um, so yes, I, I I read all over the map, and um, well, I've got a pile here actually. Ooh, this is stuff I am reading um, for. To, to, to get me inspired for my new book, essentially. And so the first two books at the top here are, this is a book called Room at the Top, and this is a book called Billy Liar. Um, and both of those are quite old books from the 50s. Uh, they're, they're British and they are about um, working class men who are trying to break out and into a different class, essentially which is something that my, my cat is really wandering around with. Um, something that the, the protagonist of my new book will do, he's going to travel to London. He is a con man and he is trying to move from uh, the working class into the middle or the upper class. Yeah. Um, and so another book that I'm reading along those lines is Martin Amos's Money, which I think is, is one of the funniest books ever. It's also one of the foulest as well. So be warned but if you really just want to turn off all good taste and howl with laughter I, I could not recommend this more and it, it just seems to get more and more true um, even though it kind of deals with the 80s um, it, 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 it is really talking about greed and capitalism and the, the kind of conspiracy of money that we are all trapped in and all have to believe in. Um, I mean, there's so many books here. I, I, this is just ridiculous how many things are just on the pile here. But uh, another one is Talented ah. Mr. Ripley. Mm -hmm. Of course, a, uh, a classic kind of con man psycho book, um, but just so stylish, so charming, so well written as well. And uh, another con person book, um, the, the Grifters by Jim Thompson, um, which is kind of at the other end of the scale. It's much more um sleazy and low life based but um but uh, no worse a book you know an, an excellent an excellent american crime novel um more jim thompson after dark my sweet which is uh, about a young man who is drawn towards a woman and in that classic noir style you know she convinces him to to kill her husband and you know everything goes wrong <laughs> um so that's the kind of book that i like um this is a non-fiction book called the truth about lies which i haven't read any any of at all yet you can see the very uncrack spine there <laughs> so um I, I can't say much about that one uh, but this one I have started, it's called The Service by Frankie uh, Mirren. And it's about three women on the edge of the uh, sex work industry in London, in kind of contemporary London. And it, it's very interesting because there are a lot of overlaps between that kind of work with, I guess, gig economy, you know, mm -hmm. the, the kind of people who are... Um, taking short contract jobs or zero contract jobs and, and things like that. And um, it, it seems very pertinent to our times, kind of people who have been pushed to the, the fringes or the edge and people who aren't really discussed, you know, widely. And, and so that, that seems useful as well. And then this is a, a proof that I've had forever, which is Social Creature by Tara Isabella Burton. And that is about a, um, I, I, I think it sounds a little bit like American Psycho reimagined in the world of Instagram. 
um, and in kind of New York uh, high society. And that is interesting to me because he's going, uh, my protagonist in this book will be interacting with um, not only the middle classes and the upper middle classes of kind of much more affluent London, but also uh, tech entrepreneurs and you know, sort of Instagram influencers who in, in this book he will discover are, you know, just as profound con artists as he is. Um, so all of that is is a is a flavor of what I'm thinking about at the moment. Fascinating. Thank you for sharing all those with us. Everyone, Pleasure. You know, we all library folks love to suggest books and get suggestions. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us what you're reading. Um, all kinds of I was, nice, uh, light, I was, light uh, fluffy uh, stuff there. <laughs> yes. I, I was a, a bookseller for 10 years. And oh, so that, that is my There you go. Um, there you go. And, and, we've got we've got someone that was wondering if you had, you know, librarians in the family or, or any <laughs> but yep, bookseller. There you go. We caught you. Yes. Very good. Very good. All right. So um, those three poll questions came up while Joseph was talking. So here we go. Oh, good. No one gave a vote to In Cold Blood. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, so The Six is indeed um, a true crime book that is not real. Stranger Beside Me is the classic Anne rule. And uh, Say Nothing I'm not familiar with, but that is also a real book as well. So number two, which true crime podcast isn't real? Um, the real answer on that is my best friend's murder that is a book not a podcast is that right i think i'm not i know that title why would i know that title i think it's a book not a podcast but i know my favorite murder is the huge one that everybody that's a big famous one all right and then true crime movie that doesn't exist Mountain Murderer is the correct <laughs> answer, yes. Zodiac is a famous case to catch a killer. My friend Dahmer, fun fact, I'm originally from Milwaukee and I was living in Milwaukee at the time when the Jeffrey Dahmer murders happened and I remember driving to work and I had to pull over because the news came on the radio and I was so horrified by it, I couldn't drive. <laughs> I was like, wait, some dude in my own town eight people what i totally freaked out so yes that is true but <laughs> mountain murderer i'm sure there have been lots of mountain murders but no no movie about it yet <laughs> so, the title of my next book i was just gonna say right you yeah. gotta you gotta create some of these all right thank you everyone for participating in that so now let's move to our audience questions and we've got some really great ones here and one thing i wanted to start with the first one because we have a couple of people who have asked the same question so i'm gonna try and sort of phrase it because i also thought it was very interesting um people who were a little taken aback at the beginning that it starts the publisher's note basically is source books severing their relationship with you and i remember when i was reading this i was like wait wait a minute what <laughs> <laughs> i was like now i'm supposed to interview this dude so obviously he's they, they might like they <laughs> might they still might after this so Tell us a little bit about that like was that just sort of like a little kind of wink wink you know put it in there for fun um was this uh, tell tell us a little bit about your decision to not only put yourself in the book <laughs> but to put source books in it as well <laughs> i well i just i just thought that i i wanted to tee up this this idea that the joseph knox character might not be someone you can trust yeah. and i knew that he was going to deliver this introduction so it seems like an audacious way of starting the book as well um but but I, 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 a very quick note, I, I was at a wedding and ran into um, the, the parents of an ex-girlfriend and the delight on their face because they thought that that was real. Um, and, or, or, well, not their delight, but they kind of quite patronizingly um, uh, said, oh, bad luck. Um, and I, I just didn't have the time to correct them before they left, so that I think they still believe um, that I'm I'm in trouble. So oh, that's too funny. That's too yeah, funny. I, 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 another bullet in my foot there. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's you know, right? Real life, right? 
Oh, that's too funny. All right. So let's see. We've got a question here um, from Donna who says, you mentioned tonight that you kind of like the notion of allowing the reader to become the detective. How does that aim affect your writing style, the clues that you leave, and how you frame them? And that's, I definitely, you know, I, I will say there, I had no idea what the end was going to be. I was a little suspicious of, of one character in particular, because I was like, mm, what is this dude really doing here? Mm -hmm. And, but you really sort of, you know, you didn't drop too many obvious clues and you, you sort of let us down different paths and then, okay, there was a whole reason for that. There's a reason for that. Did you, is that sort of how you framed it in your mind? You wanted the reader to feel like they could figure this out as, as well as the detectives could? Yes, I, I, I suppose so. I mean, obviously it's, it's such a delicate balance always yes. trying to hide it just enough mm -hmm. and just enough. have just enough detail there. I did feel in this book that the true crime nature of it allowed me to push a little further to the hidden side of things than perhaps I, I would usually. And um, to, to more directly answer the question, I think the real way that it influences my writing is that I tend much more towards the ambiguous. And so a kind of persistent uh, criticism that I've seen, which I, I completely get, is that the ending is is too ambiguous and that there are not necessarily answers to all of the big questions. Um, I, I feel like there is a big suggestion in most cases of, of what the answers, what the precise answers are, but I, I felt like the ambiguity, I, I, I felt like to answer anything too clearly and rationally would almost kind of um, make the, the, all of the work I had done to present this very convincing fake true crime book fall away. You know, that was my big fear that if it had a neat bow tied ending, it would just feel like a novel. Um, okay. And so I, I, I really, again, it was a, it was another thing where I was in rewrites kind of carefully modulating it one way or another and, you know, whether it's landed on the exact right setting is, is obviously not for me to say, but um, I, I certainly knew that it, it had to have a lot more ambiguity, I think, than the, than the, perhaps the, uh, the, the general mystery novel. Okay, that's, and I'm glad that you, you touched on that because I've got another question here uh, from mm -hmm. Diane who says, you know, right, we don't ultimately know what actually happened to Zoe. So have, have you thought about maybe a sequel on the horizon? Would you ever, <laughs> would you ever come back to revisit this? Or do you think you've, you've, you've done it, you want people to think what they're going to think and then you'll move on? I'm just curious. I, I, I think another thing on, on that note of ambiguity and this is an infuriating thing to say and think and I, I know it will annoy people but I know from the books that I have read that have not resolved as neatly or precisely as I had hoped they would uh, they seem to live on in my mind a little mm -hmm. more I seem to obsess over them and wonder about them and even go back to them and reread them and see if there's things that I missed or, or didn't necessarily pick up on and maybe see what I think happened and things like that. And so th there is an element of that as well of, of you know, it's, it's, if, if, if you did it in every book, you would exhaust people, but it did feel appropriate for this one um, to kind of intentionally leave people wondering. And I think it would probably ruin that effect if I then wrote then wrote a sequel. But um, you never know, the book I'm writing now might be rejected. <laughs> and, and you're like, hey, I still have this to finish up. <laughs> yeah, I might, I might have a, a desperate, uh, another stab at this. We could call it two crime story. There maybe. you go. Um, uh. Yeah, that, that could work. All right. Put that on the whiteboard behind you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I have a question from Carolyn who wants to know more about the idea of using identical twins in the story and why you chose to do that. Yeah, um, I, I, I guess in every 
novel, you are trying to approach um, an idea in a slightly different way or a slightly new way or from, from a, maybe a slightly different angle. And so I, I think the moment you mention twins in relation to a crime novel, people's eyes roll out of their head because it's just, we've seen it all, we've, you know, and so there's a certain challenge in in approaching it from that sense that you know you know people's guard guards are going to be up against the idea of twins they're looking for clues everywhere yeah and the the most likely thing that they think will happen is that the, they have been swapped around for some reason and so i knew obviously that i wouldn't do that um and i guess again you know so many of the answers to to the reasons why why I did things was for was was literally to serve the needs of the book and so I knew that it would surround this young woman who had gone missing but I also knew that I wanted to talk about her childhood and I knew that her parents were not the people who would give us the inside track on that childhood so I needed someone who had also lived through pretty much the exact same thing she did um, but I, I thought it would be much more interesting to make uh, Kimberly, who was Zoe's sister, as different from Zoe as possible and to examine the tension between their relationship and how the kind of pressure that their father put on them can affect two very different kinds of characters. Um, and I guess finally, you know, uh, another thing that I felt was, was an interesting thing to do with identical twins is that we never see them together you know Zoe is completely out of the picture yes. and so mm -hmm. it's it's really um Kimberly is 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 always alone in a way that none of us can really understand because we you know I, I assume most people in have not had their their identical twin vanish um and then of course there's all the associated guilt because she had had a strange relationship with her and it gave her a lot to resolve and think about in the book and so she seemed like a, a very interesting character to me yes all right let's see next question here we've got oh i just scrolled past it where did it go Oh, okay. From Carly. So she says, you've mentioned that um, your previous books, they are all the opposite of the one that came before it, right? So you had the, the cold heat wave, etc. So now this one being a standalone, and you've already <laughs> talked to us a little bit about your next one. How do you see, do you think, what, what's, what's the opposition happening there? And I know you probably can't give us too much detail about the next book, mm -hmm. but what, what can you tell us a little bit how it's going to be different? Well, I think um, I'm returning to a, a much smaller story, um, number one. So this enormous cast of characters is all going to be pushed off stage and it will be just from one perspective. But um, I'm, I'm searching for a way that it will not resemble the first person perspective that I wrote in previously. And so that is something I'm working on at the moment. And I think in essentially in, in the characteristics of this con man that I'm working on, he will inhabit different characters in a sense. And perhaps even in the moment that he is inhabiting them, operate uh, mentally on the page to us, the reader, as this other person, almost like he's become this other person. And that feels like a difficult idea to pull off. Um, and I might not pull it off, but that, that, is, that is something I'm, I'm looking for at the moment. Um, and another way that it is gonna bounce away from true crime story and from all of my books so far is that it will be the first not set in Manchester. So it will ah. be set in London. Okay. Um, and so my, my con man arrives from Manchester in London. Um, and so as well, in that, in that sense, it um, feels a little bit autobiographical for me because I moved to London as a very broke man in my 20s, you know, sort of trying to make it. And so in a much more criminal, dark way, he's doing the same thing as I am, uh, as, as, I, as I did. Um, and so all of my frustrations and bitterness uh, <laughs> will, um, will naturally uh, go into him. 
it's like a form of therapy almost <laughs> yeah i hope so i hope so <laughs> okay um we're gonna wrap up pretty soon but we've got some great questions that have come through so a couple of questions similar again that i want to ask then so the title true crime story did that give you or your publishers any pause that that might confuse people into thinking it was really a true crime i mean it clearly states a novel but let's <laughs> face it like not everybody reads that or even you know thinks about that did you was that always your initial title for the book or you know did anyone in the publishers offices say okay wait a minute if we call it true crime story and people buy it thinking it's true crime are they gonna be disappointed like tell, tell us a little bit about the title um i i remember where i was when i thought of that title and it was it was after the the fourth book i had originally written was rejected and i was in this crisis desperately trying to think up something not only that i could do but that would be interesting and different and make me stand out and give me a challenge as a writer and so i was cooking my brain lying in bed awake just every muscle tensed as my girlfriend was just sleeping next to me and just worrying and worrying and I I don't know it was it was as I began to think of these podcasts and how they merged with the oral history type book that title just dropped into my head and I literally you know this this was this was one of those notes that I sat up in bed and wrote down um so you know those things really can save you um and it just it just seemed perfect because sometimes a title suggests everything else and for me this title it it gave a clue to the kind of book that it would be um i never worried about anything like that in the uk it doesn't even say that it's a novel um, oh interesting okay. and i i pushed in every way possible to make it look as convincingly like a true crime book as as it could um to me that was just part of the fun and you know, I hope that anyone who bought it um, expecting a real true crime book isn't disappointed. Although I have seen a couple of people who are, um, and uh, you know, I'm I'm sorry to them, but this is what I wanted to do. So, right. Yeah. I know. I think overall people <laughs> love it. So I, it's, I mean, it's it's very clear. So okay, great. Well, thank you. I think that is we are coming just up on time here. So thank you so much for spending your, I was gonna say evening, but really it's the middle of the night for you. So thank you very much for your time tonight. Uh, thank you so much to our audience. We've got um, the winners of the prize packs are just popped up there in the chat. If you email Emily Ludloff at sourcebooks.com with your address, you will get your prize. Joseph, it has really been a pleasure chatting with you. Big thank you. Like I said, we know that you are busy and the time change and I really appreciate getting to getting to chat with you tonight. So thanks. Loved all the insights. Everybody's always so excited to hear about, you know, what what is the thought process that went into all this? And I think you've really shared some great stuff with us tonight. So thank you very much for that. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. I, it was it was a thrill. It was Yay. lovely to talk to you. Yay. So, and thank you to our lovely audience. I'm so glad you could join us tonight. Make sure that you join us for next month's event. That one is going to be Wednesday, February 23rd at seven o'clock Eastern. I'll be talking to Eva Yurchak, the author of the January 22 Library Reads pick, The Department of Rare Books and Special Collections. Um, uh, Sourcebooks also has a special Valentine's Day panel event coming up. That's going to be February 9th at seven o'clock. Um, the links to those are appearing in the chat, so please do go ahead and register for those. Um, register early, register often, tell your friends. Thank you so much again for joining us. I hope everyone stays safe. Um, have a lovely, lovely week and happy reading. Thanks again, Joseph. Really great to talk to you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone.